Uh, g'day out there, I'm Sean Dooley from BirdLife Australia. Now we're going to have our first Birding at Home Facebook Live session uh, coming up in just a, a minute or so. So if we're, this should be probably 20 minutes to half an hour, so sit back, get ready, and if you would like a cup of tea, a drink, or head off uh, to the loo before we start, now would be a good time because we're going to start very soon. Hi there, it's 12 o'clock and as promised, this is BirdLife Australia's first Facebook Live birding at home session. I'm your host for today. Uh, it's an honour to meet you all. Um, it's quite a, a weird experience in what is a very weird time. So I'm sitting here in my, I, I hope to do this from my garden for you. However, uh, the internet connection wasn't quite strong enough here. So I'm in my office looking over the garden and looking into my laptop screen here uh, and I can only see me so I don't know who's watching and I hope you I hope if you are welcome uh, this is a thing that BirdLife Australia is doing um, which is basically like most of us uh, the, the staff at BirdLife Australia uh, we're fortunate enough to still have our jobs but we have to work at home in order to help stop the spread of this insidious hideous virus so we are um we are going to you know the birds don't stop and and we want to connect with you out there and connect that um to to, to let you know that birdlife australia is still working to connect people with birds and still working to try and ensure that our birds have a bright future and we stand together to stop the extinction of australia's birds and so today it's an introduction to backyard birding. Now it's such a weird and pretty frightening time that we're living in. And it might seem that sort of focusing on something like birds in your backyard is, is, is something quite trivial and um, kind of ignoring the enormity of, of what's going on out in the world. However, if you're like me and also the hundreds of people that have been getting in touch with us this week, uh, at BirdLife Australia uh, right across the country. Uh, th there's something about birds that is actually a source of comfort to us in these times and, and also a source of inspiration. Um, we're getting lots of messages that for, from people that even, even in their backyards, even people living in high-rise apartments, being able to look out the window and seeing birds is a really profound connection with the world. And a connection with the world as we as we once knew it and and that we hope to get out into it to experience it again and i know that i'm feeling that birds are offering me at the moment a sense of calm and a sense of peace in in what's really freaky times and and also i'm, I'm kind of finding it inspiring uh, to to connect with the birds and see the birds that are turning up in my backyard there's something about every morning i wake up and I'm in suburban Melbourne and it's uh, you know a fairly leafy suburb, but we have quite a few birds. It's not a lot of you in the country or in, in bushier areas are probably gonna be having a far greater bird watching experience than, than I am. But even here in the city of Melbourne, I'm down on the Bayside and we have a number of uh, native birds that, that greet me every morning and I hear that dawn chorus, the birds welcome in the day and in some ways at the moment it, it's it's one of the best parts of my day because it's hearing the bird song uh, even if it is common birds or, or you know what you'd normally regard as trash birds hearing that bird song knowing that there is the planet is turning every day that the world the world continues and these birds are representative of that and it's actually one of my favorite times of the day in these these ridiculous times that we're in and the, I know that a lot of people are feeling the same way. And because we're all, many of us are stuck at home, our birds are that connection with, with normality, that connection with the world that's going on outside our backyards. Uh, and I know this because I did some media recently uh, in Perth, some radio on 6PR and some radio in Melbourne on 3AW. And there are a lot of callers ringing in and talking about how they were one they were worried about the birds 
they were worried that this whole coronavirus craziness is affecting them because they were they were getting in touch and asking questions like, have the birds gone mad too? And all of the examples that people were giving me were actually nine out of 10 of them were perfectly normal behaviours of the Australian birds that they were talking about. And what I realised is that the, it's not the birds that are really changing so much, their behaviour, it's us. For the first time, a lot of us have been forced to sit still and we're noticing things that happen around our house that we would never notice before. We're noticing these daily soap operas that are ha happening with these incredible characters that are the Australian uh, native birds. And, and they, they really truly are incredible characters. Even in world bird watching, you get bird watchers coming from overseas and they're astonished behaviour uh, the the uh, of the Australian birds. Australian birds are like no others. They're bright, they're gaudy, they're garrulous uh, on the whole. And, and, you know, sometimes they may not sing as sweetly as other birds, but songbirds started in Australia and we have incredible sounds that, that create the soundtrack to, to our lives, even in the middle of suburbs, even in the middle of, of, our, um, of, of our biggest cities. We have these birds. And as with all soap operas, it's much more interesting and fascinating when you get to know the characters. And that is what today is about. For those people who are already bird watchers, probably what, some of what I'm going to say you might already know. But this today, this session is really designed for people who might not have ever considered the birds before, who might really only have just started noticing those bright parrots that are flashing through the sky screeching or or noticing the magpie that's coming, that you wouldn't see during the day, that's coming and tapping on your window, trying to find some food. That this is this is for you. This is for absolute beginners, uh, and we're going to try and get to know the characters and learn learn how to identify the characters uh, that that we share our our daily lives with and probably haven't noticed before. Um, so what what we're going to do is I'm just going to go through basics of how I started bird watching and the things that I learned because if if you get into birds and someone will give you say a field guide to, to identify the birds like we have excellent field guides in Australia this is the last the latest one out the CSI, CSIRO Australian bird guide you get this and it's the size of a house brick it's about over two kilos or something and you open it up and there's literally 900 plus illustrations of different bird, different bird species. It can all seem really overwhelming. We have such a variety. We're, we're blessed with an incredible diversity of birds in Australia, but it doesn't really help you. And it's quite daunting if you open something like this cold and you're thinking, uh, well, there's a bird there with a funny looking head and I want to, I want to work out what it is. So don't let it overwhelm you. The way I learned as a kid, I had some people who already knew a lot about birds that helped me teach her at school and, and some of my uh, classmates, we all got into it together. But the way I learned, and I've put up on my wall here, um, the uh, one of the Gould League posters that I had on my wall in the, uh, in the late 70s and early 80s when I was a little kid. And these posters, we actually have one, and unfortunately I don't have it at home to show you, but our um, team, have uh, common urban birds of most Australian cities in a poster form. You can go online and you can download it and print it out or look at it. And that what that does, it, it kind of, it makes bird watching manageable for you because it shows you the common birds. Now, the great thing about birds is they have wings and they can turn up literally anywhere. They can fly across the planet. And, and as we speak, there are birds leaving Australia that are heading to the Arctic, our, our migratory shorebirds are now flying from all around the coast in Australia to Russia, Siberia, Alaska to breed. So birds can literally turn up anywhere and it's one of the joys of bird watching. But the fact is birds are like us, they need, they need the same sorts of things to, to survive. They need, they need a home, they need food and they need others of its own kind to have a family, if you like, to continue on their line. And they have specific needs. Each species has that different combination. And 
in terms of our cities and the places where we, we where we live, you're not likely to see all 900 species or even hundreds of species uh, of different types of birds. But what you will see are the birds that have been successful in managing the altered landscapes. And things like the, the Bibi posters or, or these posters, the farm farmland bird poster or the um, urban bird poster that the Gould League used to have, they, they narrow it down. In bird watching, we all want to see the rare bird, but the fact is they're rare for a reason in that they're the one in 100 bird. And 99% of the birds you see or 90% of the birds that you see are going to be the same types of birds. So it's not as daunting as you might think. And I'm pretty sure even if you're a total newbie to bird watching, that if you've lived in Australia, even for a, a couple of weeks, you will know the names of a couple of birds. And one of the keys to bird watching is all about finding the differences between birds. So the way to become a good bird watcher is to learn the names of the birds you see every day, the, the common birds, and to learn what they look like, what their habits are, where they occur. And so I, I liken this to, um, to, to having a template bird, to having a, your sort of um, your stock standard bird that you can then compare everything out else to. So in terms of that, you look for a bird that you know, and I'm sure a lot of people know, say, a bird like a magpie or you'll know a bird like a sparrow um, or, or a sulphur-crested cockatoo. They're really distinctive birds. We see them a lot. We're so lucky in this country to have such uh, beautiful, bold birds in our, in, you know, within our view of our everyday lives. And so when you're, you're trying to look at a bird, the first thing you need to look at is you find that keystone bird and then you compare the differences. So the first thing you can look for is the size and the shape of the bird. Um, and basically, I, I would start with, say, three birds of differing, differing sizes. So if you know a sparrow, which the, the main sparrow that people get in the cities around Australia is the house sparrow. Um, there is a, a tree sparrow, but that's that's for another day, how to, how to identify the, those two, separate those two. But so pick, say, a sparrow or a small bird as your small unit, your basic unit of bird. And then perhaps something like a magpie as your medium to large size bird. And then you can pick a, a larger bird, say a pelican or something like that. So you see a bird in your backyard. You don't know what it is. You First thing you do is you compare the size, the relative size. Is it is it bigger or smaller than a magpie? Let's stick with the magpie today. So then you, you start thinking about bigger or smaller. And then you note the difference and also the different shapes. And one of the key things to show which family of birds you're in, if you are going to go to the field guide or go and go to one of the online um, things that we'll talk about later that can help you, is look to the beak, the beak of a bird that is really in, indicating how the bird feeds. And that can really help you decide what type of bird it might be. The magpie, for instance, has quite a sharp, almost dagger-like beak because it, it, it sort of stabs at its prey in the ground, feeds on the ground. Whereas if the bird has got a narrow beak or a thin beak, even with a curve, it's likely to be a, a nectar feeding bird that uses its beak to probe into the, um, the flowers that it's feeding on. So it might be a honey eater or something like that. If it's got a, a sort of chunky short bill, like a sparrow, that's a finch. That that probably indicates it's a seed eating bird because it needs that that big um, the the big force to crack the seeds. And also the parrots, those those almost hawk like um, but beaks that they have. You probably know a parrot anyway. But when you think about it, that beak there is to crush the seeds that they predominantly uh, that they predominantly feed on. So so it's looking for those sorts of things, and that will give you an idea of where to look in the field guide. The, the next thing you look for is colour. Now, colour, birds can come in an infinite, infinite variety of colour. However, if uh, they tend to have a basic ground colour to the plumage. So a magpie, you might say, is a black bird with white markings, or you might look at it as a white bird with black markings. You, you have that sort of sense of what the overall colour is. So note the bird that you're looking at and then see where it's different from the birds that you know. And I'll use an example here. You might be used to seeing blackbirds and suddenly, uh, sorry, magpies in your backyard. 
And then you see a bird that's about the same size as a, a magpie, perhaps a bit larger, and it's all, it, rather than being a predominantly black and white, it's mainly black, but it has little bits of white. So you note that down, and then when you, when you go online or you look at a book uh, or you ask people that, that might know these things, you've got a reference point saying, well, it was a lot like a magpie, but it didn't have as much black. The other thing to notice also with the colour is things like the colour of the legs, the colour of the beak, or even the eyes. This bird that I'm imagining I've just seen, like unlike a magpie, which has a sort of a reddish brown eye, this bird has a bright yellow eye. So you would note that down, that difference from the basic unit that you have. And then you also um, look that the cut, looking at the colour, you also then look for any, the dominant colour, but also any particular features that have a different colour. And this may help you. Sometimes it's really obvious uh, in terms of finding the name of a bird. If you see a little finch bird with a sort of triangular shaped bill for cr crushing seeds, you see that finch and it's got a red eyebrow and you go into a resource online or a book and it says red browed finch, chances are you're on the money. Unfortunately, our early ornithologists weren't necessarily that great at naming birds after the most obvious feature. So it often helps to look at the uh, bird and note down. It's great to take a notebook out or just note on your notes on your phone, uh, those distinctive markings that you see. And it's really, it's really good to note where you see those markings. There's a quite a common ground bird in Australia, a, a ground feeding parrot, a grass parrot called the red rumped parrot. And it's only, this is a good example of where the names don't quite work <clears throat> because it does have a flash of red on the rump uh, up the back. <clears throat> um, except that's only in the male red rumped parrot. So if you saw a female red rumped you would have no idea that's what you were looking at. But really interestingly, we get a lot of reports at BirdLife Australia of people who think they've seen orange-bellied parrots in areas hundreds of kilometres from where the rare orange-bellied parrot would occur. And it's because they remember seeing that flash of red, they don't note down whereabouts on the bird they've seen it. So they end up in their memory as it gets jumbled. They think, oh, I was sort of an orangey red colour, yeah, and they see the name orange belly parrot and go, ah, that's what I saw. But we can guarantee that 99% of those claims are actually people who've seen red rump parrots and they've seen that flash of red, not noted exactly where they see the, um, where, where, where they have seen that red. And then over time, your memory becomes a bit hazy. So that's, that's a really important thing to do. And also, um, sometimes it doesn't work because the names we've given the birds aren't exactly instructive on what they look like. A good example would be perhaps the little raven, which is a very hard bird to distinguish between other types of ravens and crows. And they often occur in areas, particularly in places like rural Victoria and rural New South Wales, where you can get both the little and the Australian raven. However, people see the name Little Raven and expect that it's very, a very small bird. So they think everything they see is an Australian raven. But the fact is the Little Raven is technically only one centimetre smaller than the Australian raven. So don't always rely on the names, but rely on what you see and noting it down at the time. And then that will really help you try and work out where to go with that. Uh, another thing to note is habitat and location where you see the bird. And this is often as defining a characteristic as, as, where, as, as what the bird looks like. Uh, one thing it's really good to do is look for the birds in your area um, because, you know, you might open a bird book and see a bird that looks, that only occurs, that looks exactly like your bird or you think it looks like your bird. And then if you look at the map, it actually occurs only in, say, Cape York or out in the middle of the desert or something. So it's really important to, to consider where you're seeing, where you are geographically, but also where the bird is in your garden. Uh, is it up in the tree coming down on the ground? Uh, that can be a really instructive way. Is it hiding in, in the bushes? Um, where it's feeding, is it coming down to feed on the ground, picking out worms, or is it, is it in the flowers of the, of the eucalypts? Uh, looking like it's drinking the nectar, or is it? Does it? Is it snatching insects out of the out of the air? 
they can all be really useful tips on how to identify a bird. And so where it is in your garden, and that follows into the fourth key about trying to get a handle on your bird is to is to work out where the bird is uh, feeding and what behaviour is it doing. If the bird is uh, flying through the air, you know, you're more likely to find birds like swallows that and insect eating birds that, that snatch birds out of the air. Even common birds like your willy wagtail or, or grey fantails will often dart out and the way they catch a bird in the air is, is very distinctive to that species. So unlike a swallow which flies around through uh, through the air chasing insects, the willy wagtail or the grey fantail will sally forth from a branch and, and snap at a bird, an insect as it flies past. So those sorts of things are really important to note when, when you're working out how to, how to do a, a bird ID. So you've got all of this down and where to go. You, if you might be lucky enough to have a field guide and there are also field guide apps. Um, they're, they're a couple of the great Australian field guides are, are apps that you can download on your phone, but they still give you a sense of, you know, you can be overwhelmed because there are so many options. Even, and especially if you see a bird that you think might be a robin, then you look at the robins and it's not, where do you go from there? Well, there's a couple of resources that we've got for you at BirdLife Australia. Um, at, we run the Birds in Backyards page and I've just put a plug in at the moment, Birds in Backyards are actually doing their autumn backyard bird surveys, uh, which we do every quarter to get a snapshot of what's happening with birds in urban areas right across Australia. It's a really important plank of our Urban Birds program. And you go to, if you go to the back Birds in Backyards page, they have a fantastic bird finder uh, a sort of function on the website where you can try and find out, enter the details of what you've seen and it helps you try and narrow down what you might have seen. And also for those of you who haven't done it before, every October BirdLife runs the Aussie Backyard Bird Count. And that is done, the best way to do that is with a, um, it is with the app, the Aussie Backyard Bird Count app. And it allows you to record your site it's not live at the moment because we only do it in October to create that Australia-wide um, that Australia-wide uh, snapshot. However, um, what we do have, you can still download the app and it's got what we call the field guide. And that allows you to do those things that I was just talking about. If you see a bird you don't know, you go into the field guide and it's going to ask you what colour was the bird? What were the predominant colours? What was the size and shape of the bird? And, and then you can enter all of that and it's going to give you some options of what you might have seen. Options of birds likely to occur in your area with some photographs. So even if it's not 100% accurate, it's going to narrow the field down a lot for you and help you on your bird watching journey. Now, I think it's time that we get to some of your questions. I can see them um, coming up on my screen here, uh, but I've got one of um, one of the, our wonderful bird life staff who's uh, uh, Tanya, who is sending them to me as well, so that I don't get distracted. It's it's great to see so many people responding to this. I hope what I've said is is setting you on the path to being able to work out who those characters are that are inhabiting your neighbourhood space. So we'll we'll get um, we'll get started with some of the questions. Uh, and so the first one that's coming up is uh, this is a local one for people in southeastern Australia. We've got a question. Do gang gang cockatoos stay on the coast all year? Now, for those who haven't been fortunate enough to see a gang gang cockatoo, they're our smallest bird named named a cockatoo, and they're this beautiful, almost sooty grey. Uh, and the males have this flaming crimson head, little little kind of punk hairdo as well. And they they they, they occur sort of from Western Victoria just to north of Sydney. Uh, they're a bird that do move around across the landscape. They tend to nest in, in our taller forest areas. So in spring, they will tend to move up into the mountains or, or the denser forests and find nests in, um, in hollow trees. And then they, they do move out, particularly at this time of year, you'll see them on the move and they'll be heading into cities like Canberra in particular and also in Melbourne. Uh, and they come down into the suburbs and they feed they're a seed eater, but they also feed on the fruit of, of uh, introduced plants, getting seeds out of hawthorn and 
cataniaster bushes, things like that. So they do move around. Um, so it's, and now is a great time to start your backyard birding. It's a really exciting time because birds are on the move, not just the curlews and, and sandpipers and things going to Alaska and Siberia, but we've got birds moving from Southern Australia up the East Coast, from Southwestern Australia up to the Kimberley and then up to, and both of those up to New Guinea and, and, and the Philippines and Indonesia and beyond. Uh, and so birds are likely to turn up in your backyard at this time of year that you wouldn't normally see. Um, so we, uh, the other, I've got a question here, how can I discourage noisy miners? Now noisy miners or the yellow-throated miner is the equivalent in Western Australia. Noisy miner is actually a native honey eater and not to be confused with the notorious common or Indian miner. And if you don't know which one you've got, they actually do look quite similar. Go back to those basic principles. Uh, the looking at the, the general colour, the noisy miner is overall a grey bird. And then its distinctive markings are black on the head, yellow eyes, yellow beak and yellow feet. The Indian miner, the common miner, is also has the yellow eyes, yellow beak and yellow feet and the black head, but it's brown. Its ground colour, its main colour is brown. And they do both occur in cities um, the, and, and rural areas. And the noisy miner is actually quite a problem now for our birds. It's, and certainly in the area where I am in Melbourne, we don't see as many small birds anymore since the noisy miners come in because they're very aggressive and they like to establish a territory and create these super colonies that keep out all the small birds and a lot of the larger birds. And, and so a lot of what people see that they think is the aggression from the Indian miner is actually noisy miners as well. Indian miners or the common miner is very aggressive at the nesting time of year and they will evict parrots from, uh, from, from hollow trees and things like that. But the noisy miner's always here all year defending its territory against any small bird, even, even things like doves that it doesn't directly compete against. And it's very difficult to rid your area of noisy miners once they're here, but you can do things to discourage them. And that's a long-term strategy, but you need to plant a thicker garden. Noisy miners, even though they're honey eaters, they, they actually like open woodlands. So large trees with, with open grassy areas, which is exactly what a lot of our suburbs are like now. So if you don't want them in your yard, the best thing you can do is try and reduce the number, the, the amount of open space so that you can actually plant denser native shrubs and even if it doesn't discourage the noisy miners totally, it certainly gives more places for the smaller birds like the fairy wrens and the thornbills. It gives them a chance to, to get out of harm's way. And also those smaller bushes uh, are going to attract uh, lots of insects and things that those, top, those smaller birds like to eat. Um, let's see, what other uh, questions do we have here? Uh, the people have asked about the uh, questions, what, what bird ID apps can, can you get? There's a couple of local ones. There's, there's, um, a, for the ID, the, the two main field guides in Australia with apps are the Michael Morkham, the, uh, Morkham Birds of Australia. Just check here, uh, the guide to Australian birds. So if you search for that in your app store or the Pizzy and Knight, which is named after the authors and illustrator of the, of another field guide to Australian birds. Both of them are excellent. They, they, they're they not free, uh, but they're excellent and they have it, uh, illustrations. The Pizzy and Night Guide has images as well, photo images, but both of them also have calls which will help you identify the birds. Uh, there's a question here that's come up about uh, the, um, how do I, is there an app that helps you identify bird calls? At this stage, no, we don't have a Shazam for birds in Australia. I, I'm pretty sure that people are working on it. Uh, we do have on the Birds in Backyards website uh, a lot of the calls of common birds that you can you can tap onto. Um, so it's well worth checking that out to see if you if you recognise the calls. And as I said, those apps do have the calls, but you sort of need to know what the bird is before you can listen to the call. Unfortunately, um, we have some more. Um, more, actually, we're almost out of time. I don't want to go on too long. We will be doing this uh, at this time every week. Uh, and I'll talk about that in the wrap up. But the last question that I will answer 
is, uh, let's see, is what is my favourite backyard bird? Um, that's always a tricky one. It's always like picking which is your favourite child. Um, I kind of like, I, I'm at the moment, I'm appreciating any bird that turns up in my backyard. And the interesting thing of being stuck at home and, and you, you get to see the rhythms of birds in throughout the day, which is great, that, that, that pulse of life. We, all the other birds will disappear when noisy miners come in, but at the same time, we're lucky to have lots of parrots. So sulfur crested cockatoos coming over in noisy squadrons. And then we've got lots of lorikeets here at the moment feeding on the blossom of the, of the uh, eucalypts that are planted around the place. Um, so it's always brilliant to see rainbow lorikeets screeching through the air like paintball in the sky. And there's lots of musk lorikeets, but I think my favorite bird is certainly, I, I reckon the magpie at the moment. We have a pair here that have, uh, like so many people have befriended the house owners. And I think they think that we're the guests in the house. And so the, the pair of magpie I've, I've got to know really well over the last few weeks. And they, they turn up when I was planting the veggie garden and were basically hopping around me, coming in to, to look for worms as I turned over the soil. So I have to say, they're, at the moment, they're the front runner for my favourite bird, and it's not because I barrack for Collingwood and there's no footy, and I'm trying to compensate for that. Um, so we, we've hit the half hour mark, and I could talk forever on birds, as, as you're probably seeing. Uh, but we're going to wrap up here. As I said, BirdLife Australia are trying to keep you connected, connect with you, and keep you connected with the birds you're seeing. So you can always tune in here on Facebook Live every week at this time. Next week, we're going to have the, the amazing and brilliant Dean Inglison at the head of our Woodland Birds program, who's going to talk about parrots that you could be seeing in your backyard, including some pretty rare ones. We're really blessed in this country and incredibly lucky for like Australia is the land of parrots. There are birds like the critically endangered swift parrot, which is currently migrating from Australia to the mainland. And one of the few areas that they can still be seen, bizarrely enough, are in people's backyards, especially at this time of year as they're moving through. They roam the countryside looking for blossom to feed on, the nectar, the, the lerp insects on the, on the eucalypt trees, and they get that in the cities. Our cities can be really important habitat, and Dean's going to talk to you a lot more about that next week. And after that, the week after, I think we're going to get our uh, Urban Birds Program Manager, Holly Parsons, is going to talk about how to make a bird-friendly garden what you can do to attract birds in your gardens. And I see from your questions, there's a lot of um, a lot of appetite for that, for people wanting to know what they can do. And in the meantime, there's a whole lot of resources that we're providing free to you at BirdLife Australia. Um, if you, you can go to, as you can go into the uh, BirdLife uh, website, birdlife.org.au, or just if you Google birding at home, we're, we're providing a whole lot of uh, sort of materials for you and for your kids are centered around birds that you can do from home and that you can interact with. Remember the, um, so just go Google birding at home and we should come up uh, up near the top there. And also tomorrow, the um, Birds in Backyards team, the Urban Birds Crew and BirdLife Australia are doing, I feel like a weatherman here. Uh, we, we're doing, um, asking you to have a couple with the birds, just, uh, something that you can share on social media media with that hashtag. We're starting it tomorrow. Just take 10 minutes out of your morning. The, the birds are more active in the morning. Can be any time of day though, if you like. Take 10 minutes out. Just sit out in the backyard or if you don't have a backyard, just sit looking out the window and taking the time to see what's flying past, what's flying around. And believe me, it, it's a real tonic for the soul at these times to be able to see these incredible beautiful creatures that we have and that we share our planet with and, and just to take that time to time out to contemplate them. And it's amazing how much you figure out your worries of the day, uh, your worries of everything that's going on. And uh, so we're, we want to share that. We want Australia to share that. So using the hashtag, um, uh, get it right, uh, birding at home and couple with the birds, um, you can just be doing something to, to share the bird love that I know is out there. And I'm going to wrap it up now. So thank you very much for joining me. I hope this was enlightening. We're going to do a lot more of these over the coming weeks and months. 
and everybody um, keep on twitching and enjoy your birds. Thanks very much. Cheers.